Father, we are delighted to be in your presence and our prayer today is that you would lead us because you lead us to life, you lead us to hope, you lead us to freedom. And we confess, Lord, that, uh, that we're tired of wandering in our wildernesses. We're tired of ending up in our dead ends, our places of destruction time and time and time again. And so we come to you today and we ask that you would lead us. And we're excited that you would lead us to the cross where we find mercy and grace and forgiveness of all of our sins. But we're also afraid that you'll lead us to the cross and you'll ask us to surrender, to submit, to sacrifice those things that we hold on to that are killing us. So Lord, today we simply ask that we'd hear your voice, that your spirit would move in this place in a powerful way, that you would confront our lives and you would lead us. Lead us to the cross, lead us to Jesus, lead us to life and hope. It's in his name we ask it, amen. Hi. I'm DC, and this is my journey to freedom. And I started on my journey to follow Christ as a child. Um, my mom took me to church in the Sunday school, and I learned all the incredible stories of the faith. And I unfortunately learned a lot of other things that weren't necessarily taught, but were misconceptions. I tended to only see people in church looking and acting their best. So I kind of grew up with this um, misconstrued view that to be a Christian you needed to be perfect. That kind of got mixed in with my own wiring, that from a small child I hated to get in trouble and disappoint people, so I tried really hard not to do that. As I grew up and got married, my husband and I were involved in church. A lot of good things along the way, but also a lot of bad things. One of the churches that we went to was very, very legalistic and had a lot of rules and expectations. And things were put upon you as, as heavy burdens and always with the wording, this is your expected service or reasonable service. But they weren't things that were from the Bible. It was all man telling you to do this. It wasn't coming from a heart to serve God. And, and I remember after a number of years being there, um, I just, I really was struggling. It also was really hard that um, from the time I was a child, I've always had a heart to serve God and to um, just do things for Him. And as a woman there, you weren't really respected. You were just supposed to be subservient, listen to your husband, do what they said. And I just remember feeling like I was never going to be measure up. I was never going to be good enough. And I had just resigned myself to that. I just felt flawed and broken. And I remember one time after a church service, walking to the very back, feeling so discouraged and so broken. And I distinctly heard God's voice speak to me and say, but I'm the one that made you. I'm the one that put that heart within you. When my family walked into Calvary five years ago, I was totally and completely broken. I was so discouraged because of past church experiences of giving everything, of trying hard, and never having it be good enough. God had brought me to a place where I had to just absolutely surrender and let go because the pain was so great, and He pried my cold, dead fingers off of what I'd been holding on to. When we came to Calvary, I swore I was never going to be involved in um, leadership or get very involved in church. I was just going to hide in the corner and, and not really do anything, just show up on, on Sundays. Week after week, as I began to attend, I started hearing sermons like I'd never heard before, um, things that were very practical and applied to my life. And God began to peel back the hardened layers of my heart that I had put up there year after year after year. During a sermon series years ago, Three of the pastors confessed their own struggles, and one of them said, we can confess our sins to God and we're always forgiven, but when we confess our sins to one another, then the Bible says we'll be healed. And God just really opened my eyes to the fact, am I striving to be perfect and to manage and maintain and, and put on this front that I had hidden so much and that that wasn't what he wanted. So I made an appointment and I <clears throat> confessed um, some areas of struggle to one of the pastors and to a couple of um, close friends of mine also, and God began healing my life. Um, as I walked that journey, He made the Word of God come alive to me and start speaking to me. 
he started showing me that he is truly my Heavenly Father, that I can trust him, that I don't have to hide from him when I've not been perfect, when I'm struggling, when I'm doubting, when I'm fearing, that he's there for me, that I'm to run from him and not hide from him, that he's not going to be angry with me. Um, God has restored my trust. He has allowed me to serve in incredible ways um, in missions ministry and to go to awesome places like Albania and Greece and Thailand. Um, I wake up excited every morning at the possibility of a new day. I don't pick up my backpacks full of guilt and um, shame and fear like I used to. I feel like I can actually listen to God and hear from Him and that He speaks to me. Um, the song I've Been Redeemed uh, really speaks to me about shaking off these heavy chains and wiping away every stain because I'm not who I used to be and I'm so thankful that I am not who I used to be and I don't ever want to go back. God, I love those stories of how God is leading people to freedom. And we're continuing our study, uh, Journey to Freedom. We are in the book of Exodus, chapter 14. If you have a Bible or a Bible app, I invite you to join us there. We're going to be wandering through the chapter. If you don't have a Bible with you uh, or a Bible app on your device, grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you. They look like this. Turn to page 71. Uh, you'll find Exodus 14 there. If you need a Bible... Uh, you don't have one, you want to read the Bible, then take one of these with you. We'd love for you to have the Word of God and let it change your life. Hey, happy Super Bowl weekend. Yeah, nobody really knows what to say when you uh, greet them that way. But this is one of our uh, official, unofficial American holidays, Super Bowl Sunday. You, you think about this. On Super Bowl Sunday, more people gather to watch the game or the commercials, and eat than any other day in the United States at one time. The only day we eat more food than Super Bowl Sunday is Thanksgiving. And, uh, and at, at the, for all the, as many people doing the same thing at the same time on the same day, this is it. As a country, we are united on this day. Uh, by the way, I heard Pastor Chet ask you who was going to win. It was a little bit chaotic, so let me try another way. Uh, how many of you think or want the Patriots are going to win the Super Bowl today? Yeah. <laughs> I love, I love the, you know, every service has been the same. The New England fans, proper, New England, orderly, I do, we're going to win. How, how many want the Seahawks to win? Yeah, all the grunge rockers from Seattle are like, woo! Just really glad you guys kept your clothes on. Uh, this service. Um, Anyway, uh, how many of you don't care who wins? Yeah, apathy wins every service. Uh, you know, we like to win, don't we? I mean, we all want to win. I mean, does anybody here actually like to lose? Yeah, I was like, hey, I want to be a loser. See, I hate losing, but I'm excellent at it. I mean, it's just, it's part of my upbringing. I had older brothers, and so my whole life growing up, you know, I never won anything because if we were playing a game and I was winning, then somehow the board got knocked over, or the, you know, we got, had to go eat dinner at two in the afternoon or something like that where, where we couldn't finish the game, and so I never got to win anything. Uh, and then I, I, that continued in my teen years because I had a lot of uh, interest in the opposite sex, and so I excelled at rejection. And... Uh, <laughs> Didn't stop me from trying, but I was good at losing. And then, of course, I'm good at losing because, <laughs> hey, I'm a Cardinals fan, right? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that's offended some, but, you know, reality is what it is. So uh, we want to win. And, and not just ultimately in the meaningless world of sports, but we want to win in life, don't we? Uh, but some of us have gotten way too comfortable losing in life. And that is not God's plan. The scripture that has flashed up with every testimony that we've shown, remember, it, it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Don't submit then to a, a yoke of slavery once again. Or how about the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth when he said, 
Thanks be to God, for he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, See, God wants us to live a life of victory. God desires that we would believe in him and in his power to save us. Because if we believe in God, we'll trust God. If we trust God, then we'll follow God. And if we follow God, then he will lead us to life. He will lead us to freedom. He will lead us to victory every single time. So today, whether you are a seeker and you just wonder what this Jesus stuff is all about, or whether you are a frustrated follower of Christ, uh, we're going to discuss God's victory strategy. We're going to talk about God's strategy for victory. And we're going to use Exodus chapter 14 to understand this. Uh, If you haven't been with us for our journey to freedom, here's what's unfolded at this point. The, The Israelites were slaves in Egypt and they were praying to God, asking God to deliver them. God asked Moses to go and do that. Moses didn't want to. He protested. Finally, he gave in. He shows up and he says, okay, God heard your prayer. He's going to lead you to freedom. The people got excited. Uh, Pharaoh got angry. Uh, God convinced Pharaoh otherwise through 10 demonstrations of power that we call the plagues. Finally, at the end of that, Pharaoh says, get out, go away. And the the Israelites leave. And and then we come to the Red Sea. And that's what Exodus 14 is, the story of the Red Sea. It's what I like to call the Super Bowl of the Exodus event. It is the crowning moment. It's the big event. It's the point where God demonstrates his power and the, and the Egyptians are finally defeated once and for all. This is their demise. So we get to see in this uh, event God's victory strategy. It begins with us appearing weak. If we want God's victory strategy, we've got to appear weak. Pick up the story, Exodus 14, verse 1. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of pi Hahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, in front of baal Zephon. You shall encamp it, encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, They are wandering in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. They did so. God tells the Israelites to wander aimlessly around the desert. Hey, guys, here's the plan. Uh, what I want you to do and I, uh, is I want you to go out in the desert, and I want you to appear like you're idiots and you're lost. And you don't know what you're doing, and you don't know where you're going, and uh, so that, that's the plan. And remember, God was leading them with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So they knew exactly where God wanted them to be. And they were following God and he wanted them to appear weak. Uh, Does anybody like being weak? Do you want to be weak? Is that what you wake up in the morning and go, I hope today I'm really weak. Now, I see, I, I hate to be weak. And, you know, whether it's sick or hurting or dependent on somebody else or just needy, I don't want to look weak and I don't want to be weak. But God calls us and leads us to weakness. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Christ, then understand God is calling us to weakness. And, and, and that's not easy for us to do because from the world's perspective, what seems stronger? What seems more powerful from the world's perspective? Forgiveness or revenge? Yeah, revenge looks stronger, doesn't it? Uh, what looks stronger, being servants or being masters? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there, there, are, there are no business seminars on how to be a servant, you know? <laughs> what looks stronger, violence or kindness? Yeah. From the world's perspective, violence seems stronger. Slander or encouragement. See, they don't run any, you know, you know front page you know, articles about how nice a person you are. See, it just doesn't happen. From the world's perspective, they, they sell strength in all the ways that God doesn't. You see, to follow God's victory strategy requires for us to embrace an ethic of seeming weakness. Of seeming weakness. That that we have to step into a world where from the world's perspective we look like we are idiots. We look like we're weak. And that's God's intent for us. 
We know this because the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 said, But God said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Did you catch that? God says, My power is perfected in weakness, which means that, you know, we can try to live life on our own strength. And, and fight our own battles and, and demonstrate how strong we are. Or we can be weak and have God's power resonate in our lives. We can embrace God's ethic of weakness and live life God's way and allow his power to flow through us. And which one's going to result in victory? Well, weakness. Weakness. And, and this leads us to a place where we have this inner battle that is happening in our lives. Every one of us who's a follower of Christ, we have this struggle in our souls between humility and pride. Humility and pride. You see, the Spirit of God is encouraging us to step into humility, whereas our flesh, it wants to be proud. You know, look, I, just, I confess, I want to look strong. I want to look like I'm in control. I want to look powerful. But God says, I want you to be a servant. I, I want you to be kind and compassionate and forgiving, dependent on me and on your fellow servants. And if we follow our pride, then we will fight our own battles. And oftentimes we will fight against God. Because God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So if you really want to win in life, then you got to embrace weakness. you got to appear to be weak from the world's perspective and, and be weak like Jesus is weak. So step one, strategy number one, appear weak. Strategy number two, get trapped. Get trapped. Exodus chapter 14, the story continues, verse 8. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them, encamped at the sea by Pihahiroth in front of Baal Zephon. That is not fun to read, by the way. <laughs> when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Pause there just for a second. Have you guys been like on the same journey to freedom that I've been on? Because these were the same Israelites who were crying out to God for him to deliver them from the oppression of the Egyptians. These were the same Israelites who got excited that God heard their prayer and sent Moses. These are the same Israelites who saw the plagues and went, yeah, we're out of here. And now they're going, we're, it's all your fault. Verse 13, and Moses said to the people, fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you'll never see them again. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Moses told him to shut up and watch what God does. <laughs> he did. But catch this. The Israelites followed God into a trap. God led his people intentionally into trouble. Remember, they were following the pillar of uh, the cloud by day, the, the fire by night. They were following God. They were exactly where God wanted them. And God led his people into trouble. So if we want to live in victory, we will follow Jesus even into danger. We will follow Jesus even into trouble. And that speaks to that inner battle that is going on in every single one of us between faith and fear. Because faith is telling us, hey, trust God, believe in God, allow God to lead you, allow God to teach you. You can apply his principles to life, you can follow him wherever he takes you. And fear is telling you to run and look at how dangerous things are and look at how bad things are. And oh my goodness, we could get hurt. 
And we spend so much of our lives, so much of our energy uh, trying to be safe, don't we? I, I mean, think about this. Parents, you're always telling your kids, wash your hands. Wash your hands. You don't want to get sick. Maybe our kids are getting sick because we tell them to wash their hands all the time. Right? Because we ate dirt. We lived. <laughs> right? You know, don't eat that. You know, that, don't believe your dad about the five-second rule. You know, <laughs> throw it away. Somebody's leaving your house. We tell them, buckle up and drive. Yeah. Why would I start doing that now? Just because you said so? And don't talk to strangers and don't go there and be careful. And we're fixated on this idea of safe. So, what do we do with a God who has no problem leading us into danger? I mean, have you guys read this book? I mean, it is filled with stories after story of God telling his people and leading his people right into the pit of danger. You heard of these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Their stories in Daniel chapter 3. They followed God. You know where he led them? Fiery furnace. Worked out well, but, you know, they didn't know that going in. Or what about David taking on Goliath? I mean, we were like, yeah, David and Goliath, David and Goliath. But moms, when was the last time you patted your little boy on the butt while he was leaving for school and go, hey, why don't you go out there and kill you a giant? Why don't you go out there and look for some big dude to fight? No, we're like stranger danger. Don't talk to him. Avoid him. If you see a giant, run, because that's scary. You know, what about Daniel? He followed God, ended up in a lion's den. The apostles, they were, they were obedient to Christ, and what happens? They get arrested by Sanhedrin, and, and they get flogged. Just flogged. Only beaten. Yeah. What about the apostle Paul? He's thrown in the Philippian jail. The guy was beaten with rods, he was whipped, he was, he was stoned, he, he was shipwrecked. Going exactly where God led him to go. And of course, Jesus obeyed the Father and ended up on the cross. God put his servants and his people in danger in order to give them the victory. You hear that? God puts his people, his servants, in danger in order to give them victory. And yet so many times we miss out on experiencing God's power because we refuse to follow God into potential trouble. It's too dangerous. I can't do that. And we're not just talking about physical health and safety. We're also talking about our financial health and safety or our relationship health and safety. All that kind of stuff where we're going, no, it'll cost me too much. It's too dangerous. And, and so let me ask you this question. Do we really value our physical health and safety more than we value living in victory? Would you rather be a healthy prisoner or a bruised champion? Because the Israelites chose slavery. You just, I just read the passage. As soon as it got tough, there they are trapped at the sea. The Egyptian army coming at them. And what do they say? We could have been happy, healthy slaves. We could go back to Egypt and just be happy slaves. We were there. We were okay with it. Yeah, and, and you could have just left us there. You have to whine when you read that passage because that's what they were doing. They said, I'll choose slavery over danger. And how many times do we come to that place where we look fear in the face and we give in? We surrender. Three and a half weeks ago in Paris, France, the staff of Charlie Hebdo magazine, that satirical French magazine, were executed by Islamic militants. And the... Uh, the editor, the founder of that magazine, was not a believer. Uh, he mocked Christianity, Judaism, Islam uh, equally. And yet I respect his attitude because he had said years before, I'd rather die standing than live on my knees. And here was a man who had no faith and didn't have a relationship with the living God and didn't have the promise of heaven, didn't know that his sins were forgiven. And he said, I reject living in the slavery of fear. And friends, you and I, 
have a relationship with the living God. We know that Jesus is our Savior. We know our sins are forgiven. We know that heaven is our destination. We know that nothing can change that. Why then do we live in fear? What are we afraid of? If God is for us, who can be against us? Yes, it might cost us our physical health and safety. It might even cost us our lives. But did you realize that 2014 was the number one year in the history of the world for the martyrs of Christians? More of our brothers and sisters suffered and died this last year than any year on record. And what are we afraid of? And so when fear is challenging our faith, are we going to stand and and submit again to a yoke of slavery? Or are we going to remember that it was for freedom that Christ has set us free? And we're going to say, God, you can lead me wherever you want to. I will follow you. I will submit to you. I will surrender to you. I will trust you with our lives. Isn't that what Jesus calls us to? Because Jesus said, if anyone's going to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and come follow me. That doesn't sound safe, does it? Yeah. See, God is calling us to depend on him. With everything, with our lives, with our families, with our happiness, with our finances. Are you willing to trust him? You will if you want to live in victory. So God's victory strategy, we appear weak, we get trapped, and then God provides the victory. God provides the victory. Story continues, verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? I I love this. Listen to what he says. Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Stop looking back. Go forward. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. You know how the story ends. The Israelites walk through on dry ground. Not some kind of ecological weirdness that happens and they wade through the shallow end uh, for a little bit. No, we're talking about dry ground. The Egyptians followed them. They should have known better, right? But they did. They followed anyway. God encouraged their own stubbornness of their hearts and they drowned. And God provides the victory. God provides the victory. They won the Super Bowl right there. And God provides the victory in ways we never imagined. Do you think, honestly, that they would have been whining about they could go back to live in Egypt and be slaves and be happy there if they knew that God was about to separate the sea and they could walk through on dry land? No, they didn't see it coming. And God surprised his people and shouldn't have surprised. They should have known that he was going to deliver them. I mean, they'd just been through the 10 plagues. You think he'd run out of ammunition or something? (laughs) God's out. He can't do any more now. So he delivered them, and he delivered them in his way, and he surprised them. And and here's the thing. God is not predictable. God is dependable, and God is faithful, but he is not predictable. He's going to work in your life in the way that he wants to, and he's going to provide victory for you if you'll trust him, if you'll go ahead and embrace weakness, and if you'll follow him wherever he leads you, even into the traps. If you'll do that, then he's going to show up in your life, and he's going to change your life and work in your life and deliver you in amazing ways that surprise you so that God gets the credit. So that God gets the credit. What happened at the Red Sea, only God could do. That was not the coolness of Moses. That was not the wisdom of the people. That was not anything that they had done. God only could do that. And God wants to work in our lives so that he gets the glory. So that he gets the credit. Not so people can tell us how wonderful we are or or how strong we are or, or how wise we are. He doesn't do it so that we can bask in the spotlight. God does it so that he gets the credit. He gets the glory because he's the only one who's worthy of our praise. He's the only one who deserves it. And by the way, giving God the glory has to be more than words. It's not just something we say to kind of make everything seem good. God, whatever you do, we'll give you the glory for. No, it's how we live our lives. It's living his values out day in and day out. 
It's recognizing his character and his power to deliver us from slavery. And if you're a follower of Christ, then you've experienced his great power. Because you know that he has the power to move us from death to life. You know he has the power to change our lives. So today, do you want to win? Do you want to win? It's not really a rhetorical question. You have to decide if you really want to win. So do you guys want to win? Well, then appear weak. Embrace the weakness of Christ, that ethic that says, I'm going to live his way, not my way. And be willing to follow God anywhere. And he will show up and provide the victory. So today, are you fighting your own battles? Or are you living in God's victory? He gives us the choice over and over and over again. But he also gives us his victory strategy. What strategy are you living your life by? Let's pray. Thanks be to God. For you give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we don't deserve it. We deserve to live in captivity and the slavery of our own destruction, our own choices. But you have set us free. And so today, Lord, we pray that we would all sense that freedom, that victory that you have given us. And and Lord, we're all on a journey to freedom. And and we pray that you'd give us the courage to walk, to follow you, to trust you, to embrace you in all that you represent. And Father, we thank you today for your grace. The forgiveness for when we fail and when we quit and when we want to go back into slavery. Let your grace and your power resonate in our lives as we surrender again to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.